Hi everyone here. I'm Ranu Roy and I am from India. Currently I'm working in a faculty position at Amity University, Kolkata. On behalf of NARST International Committee, I welcome you all to this virtual event, forming and maintaining cross-country research collaboration. We are extremely delighted to have amongst us, Dr. Hai Yun Chu, who is joining us from Sydney, Australia. Dr. Nat Newman, who is joining us from Kiel, Germany. And Dr. Asli Susanbury from the US. We are here today because we consider ourselves committed to the cause of science education and we want to progress towards NAS mission of universal scientific literacy so that every individual on this planet has capacity to understand basic science ideas and develop scientific skills necessary to survive in an everlasting society. As we learn more about international collaborations from our expected speakers, we understand the success and challenges associated with it. I'm sure the sessions will be very insightful. Having said that, I would like to invite Dr. He Yun Chu to take the mic and start her session. Dr. Yun Chu. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I am He Yun Chu. I will share my screen. Is it okay? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's good. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, you okay. can. Yes. Okay, I don't know where to start uh, about my experience related to this international research collaboration. But I will try to keep a uh, focus on forming the group and maintain the uh, relationship during the international collaboration. To do that, I will start from who am I? Because I think it will help you how I formed my research collaboration around the world. I did my degree in Korea and then worked in Korea for five years as a teacher educator and program developers. And then I did a postdoctoral study in Western Australia, then started my first job in Singapore and I met Gavin there. Then I came to Sydney now I am working in Macquarie University as a secondary mm -hmm. teacher program developers and as a science education researcher. Because I am not a native English speaker, I had so much difficulties. So I joined to forming mm -hmm. this Asian Pacific Science Education Research Journal. Mm -hmm. This journal really supports mm -hmm. non-native English speaking researchers. So we don't reject papers because of not a good English. We, we look at the ideas. So you, you can click here, then go to the open access. Because of my background, my research all related to around here. These are just one time paper writing together, but those groups I did uh, like a project many times. So you can see because of my background, Korea, Singapore, Western Australia, there are many uh, research collaborations because I am moving around. I will start to share my international collaboration group forming uh, connected to STEAM project. Then later I will let you know how this my experience uh, made to apply the NARST uh, grant from International Committee, LS, LSEP grant. I will uh, talk about it later. So when I joined Australia, I started this STEAM project. From 2016 to till now, I received a small, I mean, not a big grant, just a medium-sized research grant from uh, Australia Korea Foundation and Macquarie University. And the focus was developing innovative teaching approaches 
working with Australia and Korean science educators. Later, Macquarie University funded me to investigate impact effects of this STEAM program. Then uh, next, I get the grant again from this Australia Korea Foundation. I was lucky to found this uh, grant bodies, but I didn't write down small, small grants here because of my collaboration. I got uh, two to three more small grants from Korean governments. So you, you see that like this research grant provider really gave me some chance to form the research groups with various people. So Australian and Korean, then I didn't have any Australian uh, collaborators in Sydney, but now I have my students, my school teachers. I mean, it's great to use this international collaboration to form research group in the Sydney. But I was able to do this one because I linked this STEAM approach related to my research strength. Most of the time, those research body, Australia Korea Foundation, their focus was like bring people, exchanging people and having workshop. And the focus is not the research, but I tried to target on the research for, from this collaboration. So what I did, I developed all these teaching approach modules related to STEAM. And we developed many modules, seven, seven modules so far. Then also another teacher at uh, the school, um, uh, outside the school programs. I will use this example to show you what I did with my international collaborators among Australia and Korean researchers. This is one of the examples we developed the program. We tried to integrate lots of ideas that can incorporate cultural practices around the science education. So the key focus is making students to learn science. So my research background is investigating student science, conceptual development. So I was able to keep my research in the middle, but I incorporated the cultural practices using Korean's STEAM uh, learning criteria. So STEAM was very difficult for me at the beginning because of this interdisciplinary approach. But while I am working with this Korean group, and I think I and my Australian researchers were understood lots of ideas about STEAM. And it's in, implemented to the school. Mostly I followed the inquiry instructional model, which is I am very comfortable. And my researchers and Korean partners also are able to know about it and we did research around. So what we found at the end, we found that because of COVID from this research, we couldn't find Australians uh, data because we couldn't go into the school, but we only did all the program implementation via online. But luckily, I was able to get Korean students' data. Then we uh, got, we were able to know that all those integration really helped them to apply science concepts in a new situation context. And they were able to be more creative and they really interested in science learning. So those STEAM program also gave me lots of publication of uh, outcomes, uh, conference papers, and invited talk. I mean, working with many science educators between Australia and Korea really gave us lots of opportunities. It was possible because we always keep the research in the middle. Whatever we are doing, we included the research around there. And because of a grant body wanted 
us to have a workshop, we also used all the opportunity to create the teacher workshop. So we invited the researchers and teachers in Australia. Also, we did Korean workshop. So when we visited Korea, we opened the Korean workshop. So Australian researchers visited Korea, and then we opened this Korean uh, teacher workshops. So we were able to meet the grant providers' requirements, but at the same time, we did lots of research around the grant. And we will have workshops soon in Australia. Because of my uh, experience, it also gave me great opportunity to apply this last linkage science education program grant. Now I can introduce this team project to the Indonesian uh, school teachers and the uh, researchers. So these are our team members. How I uh, form these groups, it's based on the Korean Australia uh, team. Like Pfizer is one of the chief investigators in Korea's uh, PhD student. Rachel, I met her often in NARST conference. The three of us uh, prepared the proposal together. And then this is our project uh, title. And we had this first workshop. Again, before we run this workshop, we prepared all the questionnaire to diagnose their understanding about action research. So we tried not to forget about research components. And then uh, when we had the second workshop, it was methodology based. And now first workshop, we have 500 more participants. But when we had the second workshop, there are again about three, 290 participants. Now the small group uh, teachers are working on action research. We are supporting them. And some of them working on uh, applying one of my program, our program from Australia Korean collaboration. And then they are looking at some student learning and their attitudes. So based on what I did so far, this is my summary. Attending conferences and keeping the relationship with researchers from various countries are very important because I always attending NARST and also I always attending Korean conferences. Keeping and using our own national working experience backgrounds are very important. And I think finding funding bodies, that's the very important factor and also building up international research based on our own research strength and working with various groups for various activities, giving us lots of experience and ideas also make us to learn about leadership. And it's easy to forget the, the research component. So we have to work hard to keep the research component around this international. Uh, collaborations. I think I'm not sure whether I was able to answer how to be the, the network and keeping the relationship, but I think that's what I form, how I formed my groups and how I was able to working with them continuously, lots of activities, lots of publications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hai Unshu. And uh, yes, re really, it is very insightful for all of us, especially the early career researchers like me. And um, thank you very much. So, and uh, we'd like to invite our second guest speaker, Dr. Nat Newman.
to take the mic. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you see the slides? I suppose so. Yes, um, yes, we the, can see them. Yes, and thank you for inviting me to speak about forming and maintaining cross-country research collaborations. Uh, very much like hey I, I I was struggling on how to approach this um, this talk and um, you know because it's essentially when I started doing this I kind of realized that it's hard to even in like a linear fashion describe how my um, my collaborations developed and that's partly because there's there's different parallel strands going on and then there's also stuff going on beyond these strands um you know the three strands that i was able to identify is uh like a european strand you know and essentially um a collaboration that started 2005 um actually it started earlier because when i was hired in 2005 um in in uh, at the university of essen as a as a postdoc um i happened to live very close to the office um and that is close to the university so every time uh, the university um, or the the research group i was in on the teaching and learning of science was having an international guest researcher they were asking me to go to the main train station pick the researcher up and take them to the uh, to the guest house. And actually, by the way, that's a very fun fact and nice connection. Hey, you know, the, the, the first person ever was David Trigot. Um, and, and, and so I picked David up at, uh, you know, on, on, on a Sunday and, and he was like, well, how do I get some food so I can cook me some dinner? And I'm, well, David, this is Sunday. There's no stores, grocery stores open on a Sunday. And he was like, shoot. And I was like, well, you know what, if I come back for dinner time and just, you know, take you someplace and we go eat together. And from there on, I kind of developed that into a habit. Like every time, you know, we were, uh, I was picking up, uh, when I say we, I mean me and my wife, um, we were picking up um, researchers. Uh, we kind of like suggested that if they don't want to cook or they don't want to, you know, like just go and, and sleep, you know, we'd be available to take them out for dinner. And that helped a lot with you know like the english the uh development of collaborations and the uh when my boss realized this um later in 2005 he kind of like tasked me with getting started with you know like international collaborations and 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 funny enough at that time there was a dfg that's the german science foundation and the nsf had like a bilateral thing going on where they were asking for applications and I was tasked by Hans Fischer to write a grant with Joe Ellen Roseman and uh, Joe Krychik. And so we got started, we wrote a proposal, um, Joe and Joe Ellen didn't like it and it kind of like didn't manifest. So we never submitted anything. And the idea of that grant was like an international uh, video study, you know, comparing instruction in different countries to understand how different countries um, um, or how science education in different countries leads to different results in large scale assessments such as TIMS or PISA. And we kind of like reuse this idea and that's what, what was happening um, then on, on, on a smaller scale with uh, Joni Viri from Finland and Peter Labuda from Switzerland in what we call the QUIP project, the Quality of Instruction in Physics project, which was an international video study where we compared instruction in those um, three countries. And obviously that was a European research collaboration. And that was like my first, um, my first international collaboration. And then there was kind of a bit of a break uh, in terms of European and very recently, we kind of got together with people I knew through this QUID project uh, to form a project that was about promoting um, coherence in, um, um, science teacher education, which essentially involved a whole lot of people from the Baltic area, the Northern European area. And there was a second strand, which uh, was um, what I called the North American strand, um, where I kind of like engaged with people, um, mainly at NARST in different individual um, studies. And I'll talk about this later, which kind of led to one research project would let, which led to another research project. And as I'm saying, I'll, I'll talk about this in greater detail in a minute. And then more recently, I kind of like got a collaboration started with 
well, Asia more generally um, and, and China more specifically, because I was based on the research I've been doing with colleagues from North America. I was approached by a Chinese grad student who asked me if he could you know, like do a research stay with me for a year. And um, so he went, he came here for a year and then I went to, went to China to work with him there. And that kind of led to uh, me meeting Chinese scholars that invited me to become part of a collaborative project with, well, colleagues I knew through the, um, the energy projects I've been doing, uh, Davis For David Fortis for one, but also Troy Sedler. Uh, who's one of the editors of JARS, who I've never had met before, or well, I've seen him at conferences, but we've never spoken. We met in this high level foreign experts program in China and, you know, like through this started to form a new collaboration. Um, so to kind of foreshadow my conclusion, you know, this was not like a straightforward thing that was like, I did this and then I did this and then I did this, but there was a whole lot of things going on in parallel. And there were breaks in some of these strands. Um, so how did, you know, at least the North American strand really start? Um, I would say like a lot of um, research collaboration, it kind of started by accident. Um, I was sitting at an NARS conference in New Orleans. It was my first NARS conference. I was sitting uh, next to a person who goes by the name Ross Name. And um, we were listening to a talk of one of the German PhD students and uh, it was all about statistics because the Germans love their statistics. And Ross was leaning over and saying, I think we're the only two in the room who really understand what's going on here. Um, so we kind of went, went out for a coffee and we got into discussing um, Russian analysis because both of us at that time were very interested in, you know, like using Russian analysis, refining assessments, improving assessments. So. These kind of discussions led to a research stay um, in 2009, where I spent a couple of weeks um, working with Ross on a paper evaluating instrument quality in science education using Rush analyses that we published in 2011 in the International Journal of Science Education. And, you know, Kind of through Ross, I kind of met Bill Boone, who's a, a huge fan of Rush. Um, he's written books about it and is a is a strong promoter. So Bill and I got together, and um, you know, I told him about a paper I've been working on that was about towards uh, developing a, a learning progression of energy using Rush analysis. And Bill got all excited about it. He was like, "Well, let me help you." published that paper right and and he came to Kiel for like two or three weeks and he stayed here and we both worked on this paper um that was eventually published in 2013 partly because it kind of got lost in the system at some point so um the um i had sent an earlier version of this paper to joe krychek who was the the jarst editor at this time you know to see if he'd be interested in this and if he thinks it kind of like would fit jarst and joe got back to me and said um oh this this is really interesting um because you're working on a model or off a model of you know, energy learning that is very close to what I did with colleagues, right? And let me introduce you to them. So next NARST, and um, that was in, um, I think it was 2011 in Orlando, he introduced me to Jeffrey Nardine and David Fortas. And uh, we kind of like immediately resonated. We we're talking energy, you know, like for the remainder of the day, like how do students learn about energy? How did you do this? How did we do this? And that kind of led to another NARST event, uh, which was a joint um, symposium that we did the year later um, at the NARST uh, conference in Indianapolis 2012, uh, which was a symposium about working towards a learning progression of energy um, and involved um, besides uh, David and Joe and I, it, it kind of involved um, Shu Feng Lu and uh, we had Charlie, uh, Andy Anderson um, as a discussant and Reiner Stewart, who's been my predecessor at the IPN in Germany um, as a presider. And it was pretty successful. And I don't know if Gavin remembers, after this, we've been lingering around in the, in, the, in the room and we've been discussing like, oh, this is really cool. And we should, you know, like join efforts. And we need to do something together. 
And uh, Gavin was at NSF at that time. And he said like, oh, this is really interesting. I think NSF would be interested to kind of like fund something like this. Um, so we're looking out, reaching out to a couple of other people that were working on energy um, for one author, Eisencraft. And um, as it turned out, you know, we kind of like, um, you know, had common ideas. And one of those ideas was like, oh, we need to bring people together internationally to discuss the teaching and learning of energy in K-12 education. And um, that was a supplement to a grant that was already existing and the grant that author and, and Bob Chen had. And we did two summits, one with researchers, one with teachers, one in Michigan, the other one in Boston. And, um, you know, we kind of like wrote a book um, on the teaching and learning of energy. Well, he edited the book. Actually, the, the people who are attending the conference um, were writing the chapters. And, um, you know, throughout the book, and that was very interesting, especially with this book, I always had the feeling that, you know, one reason people love to work with me is because of these like very German features, you know, so like every meeting I came like fully prepared, you know, I had read all the materials. I have been working late night shifts to, you know, like edit um, Helen Quinn's chapter in this book and, and, and stuff like this. So I think people kind of like were excited about, hey, there's this weak German guy who loves doing all the work. Um, we should continue working with him. So after we published the book, we kind of got together and we discussed, you know, like the idea of, implementing a completely new approach that's been discussed at this conference um, about teaching energy. So uh, Joe, uh, Jeff, David, and uh, David Fortis, Jeffrey Nordin, Joe Krejcik, and I teamed up and wrote an NSF grant, a core grant that we got in, uh, I think, 2015, and that ran with extensions for like um, five years, uh, which was my first international, like, collaborative project where I was this, you know, one of the PIs really. And, you know, I was not involved as a postdoc or co-worker or someone. I was, I was, I was the PI on this and uh, with the other ones. And that kind of like sparked a whole lot of um, new papers and, you know, kind of all of these activities and a whole lot of other activities that I've been involved with through knowing someone here or knowing someone there kind of led to the fact that um, I've, well, actually th almost three years ago, been elected to the NARS board as a board member, which kind of offered, again, you know, like new opportunities, like at the last board meeting, for example, Noemi Wade from Buffalo University, um, State University of New York in Buffalo approached me and asked if she could join me for research day during her sabbatical at the IPN and uh, we've been discussing some ideas of helping underserved communities um, using engineering projects, right? And and this is kind of like how these things emerge, you know? I, I, I feel like it's not like something that you're planning, but it's rather something that kind of develops, right? In, in, in forming and maintaining cross-country um, collaboration. In the beginning, it's just you. That's the little blue dot, right? Uh, like, my little sad me, but then you're meeting other people. You're meeting someone here, you're meeting someone there, you're discussing an idea for a study, you're writing a paper together. And that kind of like gets you to meet new people, right? And then some of these are, and that's the, the larger gray circles, right? Some of these are hubs um, and, and hubs are people like Joe Krychek. No, Joe knows like everyone, right? So you talk to Joe, and he's introducing you to a lot of other things. Another person who's a hub is uh, Shu Feng Lu, um, who like every NARS conference I met Shu Feng, he was introducing me to a whole lot of new people. Um, and, and Gavin was one of them, uh, by the way. Um, and Gavin and I happened to collaborate uh, together with my wife actually on a couple of things um, as well. And, and that's like how it works, right? You're meeting someone who's meeting or introducing you to someone and then you kind of like get together and you're running something together and all of a sudden, and before you really know it, you're developing this cool network um, of people that you're knowing and that you like to get together with uh, to work with them. And um, to, um, you know, essentially 
things that are fueling the development of those networks are conferences like the Azera conference um, for Europe, but in particular for me and, and, and my international collaborations, um, NARS as a professional um, community. And the um, couple of conclusions um, that, and, and, and kind of recommendations that I wanna share with you based on you know, like my experiences is, I said this uh, a minute ago, NARS conferences were really networking opportunities and you should use them. You know, a lot of times that I see people do is, or what I see people do is they clinch together with the people they came to, you know, like a lot of Germans love to hang out with the Germans, but that's not the idea of an international conference. Really the cool thing with an international conference is it gives you the opportunity to go out with people that you've not met before. Right. And, and, and that you can share new ideas with. Um, then I think it's important to not just go to conferences and present about your work, but it's also very important to, to write publications, um, especially if you discuss ideas with people. Don't, you know, like leave it at that. Kind of like try to get your ideas down to paper and publish them because those publications are typically means to start new like concrete collaborations. Um, my experience, it's really sometimes hard to kind of like gather international funding uh, because the opportunities are scarce. You know, it's like a lot of countries don't like spending money that then goes to other countries, right? So, but it's very rewarding. And, and if I can say this, um, you know, with all things that are sometimes said about the United States, the NSF is one of the funding agencies that has been very generous in terms of funding um, research that's actually done in Germany and then and, and, um, giving money to a German institution. Then I think what's very important is serve your collaborative partners and your community, right? It's, it's really, um, you know, I've been I've been not talking about this too much, but I've been doing a lot of committee work. Gavin and I have been sh uh, uh, chairing a strand together, um, a NARS strand. Um, I shared a uh, uh, shared um, strand with other colleagues. I've been working on the international committee um, in uh, a, a couple of years. This is how, again, you know, something how you meet people, how you get to know people, and. You discuss with people, you develop ideas and how you expand your network. And, and I think that's the important part of, you know, like collaboration is to be open to some extent, open to meet new people with new perspective, because that's what's kind of helping you grow, grow your own work, but also grow your network if you're really building on what other people have to say which is sometimes hard. I mean, we all think, you know, we know how it works and, and we love to kind of communicate about our ideas and not so much listen. Um, I'm a very good example for this. Um, so I'll not talk much more, but I'll say uh, one last thing and that's my sincere feeling uh, collaborating internationally for like almost 17 years now, I think is that they really like international collaborations traveling make the world a better place especially in times where we see increasing nationalistic um tendencies i think this like international traveling international collaborations going to countries um that you've just read on the news about and experiencing firsthand what the situation is there how people are there and experience their hospitality makes you look at the world in a different way. And I think um, to that end, I'm really thankful uh, to the International uh, Committee for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. And I think the International Committee of NARS is probably the most important committee to that respect because it kind of fosters these collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Thank you very much. You uh, pointed out several uh, aspects of international collaboration, and uh, definitely these, uh, the questions or the broad aspects that you raised, it's definitely we as science and researchers, we need to think more and more and to come up with some sort of um, ideas so that we can just progress towards instead of like procrastinating like what to do and oh my god if there is a challenge I might not be able to uh, mitigate the challenge instead of that 
it might definitely might come up with uh, some ideas uh, to move forward. Uh, thank you very much. And um, next, I would like to request uh, Dr. Susan Burry to come up and deliver her talk. Thank you, Ranu. Um, uh, are you guys able to see my screen too? Just to check. Yes. Yes. Okay, can. great. Uh, thank you. I do see the thumbs up too. Thank you so much. And um, I want to thank Renu and Gavin to invite me to this uh, discussion today. And, um, and I just, you know, listening to the first two presentations, it's just great to see some of the ideas can just really move beyond the national boundaries and, 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 you know, move towards work in a global impact. And my presentation will be slightly different because today I'll be talking from the perspective of National Science Foundation and how National Science Foundation can be one of the vehicles to kind of set up those kind of collaborations or advance the collaborations. And um, I'm a, right now a program director there and the Division of Research on Learning, and um, uh, which is one of the divisions at NSF, but I'm also a, a rotator. Uh, I'm actually an associate professor at the University of Maine, and um, I'm a uh, pretty, uh, you know, um, consistent participant of uh, in uh, participant of NARS, and I also serve in uh, served in various uh, NARS com um, committees. So, um, but once again, today I'll be mostly talking about the NSF perspective. And um, let's see. All right. So before I dive into like what are the opportunities that are out there and how can NSF be a vehicle if you especially start talking about ideas with your colleague in the United States or you know you have a project that's ongoing but you need funding to advance that project, I want to show you a little bit of the organizational chart we have at the National Science Foundation. And uh, and if you look at this chart, like our director is basically you know at the the high level of NSF and uh, that gets informed by the National Science Board and the Office of the Inspector General. Um, and that, uh, and just to, you know, make sure everyone knows that the National Science Foundation funding uh, is, comes from the tax dollars of the United States, uh, you know, residents and the, and the citizens uh, and, and, you know, any, everybody else who pays taxes, basically. And, um, and, and, in addition to that, we have directorates under uh, this director, which is kind of like similar to colleges at you know academic settings or schools. Uh, like this can be on engineering or education and human resources, which is the house uh, that you know given in our programs are in, and and then each directorate also have divisions. But in addition to this kind of you know uh, disciplinary divisions that National Science Foundation has, we have offices that ensure certain uh, aspects of the work, like for example, Office of Diversity and Inclusion that uh, looks for opportunities to advance the diversity and inclusion in NSF projects. And uh, the orange one that's highlighted over here is the Office of International Science and Engineering, uh, which is the one that I'll talk a little bit about today. And uh, this office is the one that we work with whenever we have a project that is on, um, you know, that's uh, proposing an international collaboration partnership. Uh, but in addition to that, this office also, uh, you know, comes up with ideas and promotes certain type of research. So this office, uh, so, you know, you, you might wonder, so this is, you know, very US-based institution, right? But it does have uh, some motivation to fund projects that are international and fund people who are at international settings. And, and this is actually, you know, if you go to this uh, office's website, you'll be able to see variety of countries that already has established contacts like Israel, Germany, uh, Spain, uh, Costa Rica, there are a lot of those, and also regional contacts such as Middle East uh, or, you know, Asia General, that you'll be able to contact and ask your questions about, you know, um, what kind of programs exist, what kind of resources exist, um, or, or very specific questions in regards to your project. So one, uh, the overarching goal of this office is to really uh, promote this innovation among U.S. research community through providing access to international knowledge, infrastructure, and capabilities. So uh, basically the idea here is that the US research 
and the workforce will advance further if we do have access to international knowledge, infrastructure, and capabilities. And perhaps some other scholars, as mentioned before, who does the good work, right? So um, under this overarching goal, there are several objectives that this office has. Uh, and one of them is to basically create a globally competent US workforce and, and promoting that in, you know, with funding or other structures that exist uh, in the US that are, uh, that are funded by the National Science Foundation. And the second goal is to improve the international partnerships to leverage the resources in a better way. And these resources can be US-based or foreign-based, uh, but you know, NSF thinks that if we actually uh, help network and, uh, and promote these partnerships, then there's gonna be a more effective leveraging of these resources. And then uh, the third one is uh, you know, providing opportunities for the US leaders to actually uh, be able to you know, shape what is you know, going on in terms of the most recent, most innovative science and engineering projects. So uh, because of these motivations, you know, NSF has this office and they're open to fund international projects and international scholars uh, who works with the United States scholars. So um, one uh, way that I wanted to talk to you about, and I think this is the most common way that I would see science education scholars kind of uses this opportunity at NSF uh, is actually providing uh, or proposing ideas that has international partners on ongoing projects, uh, like ongoing programs, sorry. And uh, some of these ongoing programs for those who are less familiar with it is that we have the RK12 program that focuses on discovery research at the K to 12 settings in, uh, in the formal learning environments. This can be about teacher, teacher learning, student learning, or uh, assessment, um, you know, it can be about a variety of topics, but the focus is formal learning settings. And, um, and then the other program that is, you know, that has yearly solicitations is ITEST program uh, that's actually funded by the H1B visa fees uh, in the United States. And it focuses on technology experiences and career development uh, for, for, for learners. And in this case, the learners can be at informal settings, formal settings, and uh, basically all ages. And, um, and then another one that's a, you know, a yearly uh, uh, recurring program is ASL. Uh, that is basically about advancing the informal STEM learning environment that has a focus on informal learning settings. So any, you know, if you do have a colleague and you're uh, basically uh, formulating some ideas, discussing some ideas, or you already have a paper and you want to advance it and wanted to submit an NSF proposal to any one of these programs, you can propose an international partnerships in link to that proposal. And that would come to uh, a program officer uh, like myself or Gavin or, uh, you know, Jifang used to handle some of, some of those and, and I handled a few of those. And uh, these proposals will need to get an approval from the, uh, from the International Office uh, of Science and Eng Engineering uh, because this is, you know, uh, like we cannot approve the, any positive recommendation on these fundings unless it is approved for, for, uh, from the international office. So I wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to get that approval. And um, also some of these maybe ideas, you know, uh, can help you have a good review from the panel because one of the uh, jobs that the NSF panels would do is to look at if this international partnership is critical to the implementation of the project. So what are some of the things that you can attend to in a proposal that has international partnership that can basically give you a successful um, panel uh, and also perhaps a successful approval from the international office? So uh, one of the things that I would see with these successful proposal is that um, they are explaining why the project can't accomplish its outcomes without the access to the international partners or international contacts. So sometimes this can be the case of a collaborative project. Like if you have a collaborative project and uh, basically um, where you have a com comparative study and the comparative study can 
uh, cannot be accomplished without the international partner, uh, you can talk about that. Or it can be a facility or a program that's developed internationally and without the existence of the international partner, uh, you cannot actually accomplish the outcomes of the work. And the other thing that is critical is to describe describing the context. So what is the context that you'll be working with at the international setting and in the US setting? And, uh, and how do they compare? Uh, what are the similarities and differences in these contexts? Why is this context is particularly significant for this project? Um, and then the other thing that is critical uh, when we're you know, going through this approval process is to understand the expertise of the COPI, the international COPI we have on the project. Um, or if it's a collaborative proposal, you're potentially the PI. And uh, we, as the program directors, need to be able to explain what kind of expertise this, pro uh, this PI is bringing. Or if you're a project team member, like you might be on an advisory board and your expertise is so critical, and we need to be able to explain uh, to the international office why this expertise is critical and what accomplishments you had so far, such as published articles, or, uh, or impact that you did on uh, certain contexts that, uh, that can basically convince the international office that this is an important um, opportunity to improve uh, you know, the idea that you're working on. And then uh, the other one that I saw that becomes important in these projects is to basically explain how you're coordinating activities across different settings, especially when it's international setting where like, you know, it's further away and uh, ethics uh, rules might be different in these institutions and data management software might be different. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of tricky situations. So uh, explaining how projects, activities and, and research data management and all those things will work across those settings and how you're going to manage it or anyone in your team will manage it is an Another critical aspect of these proposals that panel uh, likes to see or appreciate seeing, and then the international office would like to learn about. Um, so um, after you know talking about a little bit of those um, basically strategies that you can use in proposal development, um, I wanted to talk uh, some of the programs that actually you know the international office itself uh, promotes. And um, what, what you're going to see is like these general um, uh, programs that the international office manages is to improve these partnerships, network opportunities, and also uh, experiences for students. Uh, you know, when students kind of go travel and learn from, um, you know, different settings, as you see in the first two presentations, that actually is something that starts those kind of networking opportunities. So. Um, the first one is more about, you know, accelerating research uh, through this international network to network collaborations. And, uh, and in this one, you would see, you know, like there's, there's going to be a grant challenge that's identified by the National Science Foundation. And then we would look, uh, we will look for the, um, the networking opportunities to address to that grant challenge. And, um, and then international research experiences basically to uh, crossbreed ideas across different countries uh, so that you know, it can be enriched. And then partnerships for international research and education. This is, uh, as of right now, there's a lot of emphasis on climate change and clean energy. Uh, so uh, anything that is gonna be an international way to address uh, to those challenges are welcomed in this program. And, um, and then I just wanted to give you a couple ideas of uh, like, what are those themes, like current programs within those um, basically ideas that the international office has. Uh, and one of them, for example, is focusing on transatlantic platform recovery, renewal and resilience in a post pandemic world. So the, uh, the NSF thinks the best way to address the post pandemic world is basically through these international collaborations. And that's why there's a specific solicitation on this topic that researchers across different fields, uh, including those who are doing social science research can submit to this program. And another one has been um, quite popular for a while is the 
Ar Arctic related programs. And more specifically, there is one right now on Arctic doctoral dissertation research improvement grants. And, um, and a lot of the you know, researchers who basically utilize this program is from uh, the geo, geo uh, directorate, basically geology directorate. However, there have been people across other uh, areas as well that basically, you know, it went to and settled in the Arctic in, in a research lab and, and work to understand the changing, uh, you know, changing Arctic right now and, and what we can do about it and how it can help us understand some of the scientific problems. So um, these are some of the programs. And if you do go to NSF's uh, International Office website, you'll be able to see others as well. Like there's one on data revolution because data science is really important and critical. And another thing that will benefit from international partnerships. Um, so this is basically just a few pointers that I wanted to give to you, and um, and I'm at NSF uh, for next year as well, and I'm managing a couple of uh, international partnership related awards. So if you do have you know any questions right now, I can take those, or I'm happy to uh, you know have a meeting with you um, if you if you contact me on my NSF email address. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berry. Thank you. It's it's really very uh, insightful and I get to know so many options and opportunities uh, that exist for international researchers like us. And uh, since we have just are left with six minutes, so it's time for question answers. So if uh, there are questions from the audience, uh, please feel to ask now, now is the time to ask uh, our guest speakers. Um, I do have a question for Dr. Barry. So if I, can I? Sure. So uh, my question, since I, my PhD is from United States, but currently I am working in a faculty position in India. Now, uh, while I'm doing an international collaboration, and it's, it seems that there might be uh, some, there might be instances or there might be situations where there will be uh, the research uh, methods or the research knowledge that uh, a US-based researcher has is not aligned to what the other person in the international context has. So do you know what I mean? Like the so non-alignment of perceptions or non-alignment of understanding of the research idea. So in that case, mm -hmm. so what happens? So And it is kind of complicated, the situation like mm -hmm. if the partners are not in, a, in an alignment or their ideas are not being very uh, balanced in, uh, mm -hmm. with, with respect to a particular uh, idea. Or, a, or the topic that they are researching for and what how to uh, troubleshoot those kind of issues like mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. quite obvious because the way yeah. uh, other countries do research is very much different from what, the way united states they do the research study so the the mm -hmm. concept of uh, conducting a research is different so how do we address those challenges uh thank you Renu, for the question so um i mean I can actually respond to that from several hats, but uh, just speaking strictly from, you know, NSF funding. Um, so like if, you know, if there is an idea, for example, like one of the ways I think um, to kind of address that is to actually apply for a conference funding uh, and basically bring scholars who are, uh, who are having significant contributions to the research methods and bring them together and basically discuss and how to maybe find more uh, alignment across some of the, uh, some of the research methods that has been used within, I don't know if you're, uh, you know, strictly speaking within science education education or, uh, you know, or more broadly, you know, STEM education in, in various disciplines, etc. But um, I think one good way to start to address that can be a, uh, an, a conference proposal that will be submitted with, um, you know, 
someone who is right now in the United States, but have partners like yourself or other other people. And um, because I, I've been exposed to maybe not so much as methods, but the concept crowd sometimes like Rick Duschel and I, we wrote a learning progression review paper and, and noticed that how different concepts have, have been used for the same meaning while like, you know, uh, they would basically use, uh, people would use uh, the same concept, but with different meanings. And I think, you know, I can understand that that's happening with the research methods as well. Uh, and I think the, the first way to start that perhaps with a conference uh, that has international partners and ensuring or, or like showing that how that would also uh, improve the science education landscape in the United States, mainly because, you know, NSF is funded by the tax dollars. And, uh, and I don't know, Gavin, if you have any additional idea, but I think, you know, for me, like that seems to be the uh, one of the good means to go with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Yeah, the screen. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Ranu. Um, so basically, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, it was really interesting to know um, uh, that uh, NSF also funds uh, international uh, audiences as well. Um, so uh, I think it's a good starting point for me. So currently, I am working at the Khan University in Karachi. So I I'll definitely look out uh, for the possibilities and um, get back to you with further questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Desmond. Um, so uh, may I invite uh, Kevin, Dr. Fulma, to just, since we are left just with one minute. So sure. if you can just um, yeah, the you have One more thing you want to say? Oh, one question? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so, Kevin. Oh, mercy, mercy, yes, yes, mercy, yes. Yeah, mercy. Your question, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, yeah not, a, not a question, not a question, but I just wish we had more, more participants, so uh, more viewers at this, uh, at this workshop. Uh, it has been so interesting, and I want to thank uh, Gavin and, uh, and Ranu for sharing and organizing this, because uh, we have gained a lot from it. And I, I, I wish, all, so that's why it's good that it's recorded so that others could view it and see exactly what has been done. Uh, when you was imagining, uh, at times you from one session to the other, trying to uh, take care of your paper, trying to, so, but I think it's very, very, that's just where you can collaborate. That's just where you can meet others from other countries. And uh, uh, the last speaker who talked about uh, uh, before the project is accepted, it has to take the approval of the science and engineering. Uh, Asli, I don't know, does that prolong that process or it's usually very fast? Well, uh, <laughs> I think Gavin is going to laugh at this too, where um, there is a really big time range uh, when, you know, we're making a positive recommendation on a strong NSF proposal. And, uh, you know, what I try to do, and I know other program directors too, we try to get this approval as we are doing the other things during the recommendation, like there are, you know, uh, various processes, like we, you know, we need to check the budget and other, other yeah. aspects of it. So there's like, you know, sometimes you can go through those steps uh, in a few weeks. Sometimes it can be a few months uh, because, you know, maybe there's a, a question and, or, uh, or the, you know, officer from the institution, it, didn't get back to you in time you know there like there are a lot of complications mm -hmm. that that can happen but um you know what i try to do is usually try to fill out the approval form as soon as you know we know that there might be a positive recommendation um so you know i wouldn't say it's extremely long but usually the thing that i would say that the thing that is long is that whole you know uh, rec making the recommendation sometimes 
Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to kind of wrap it up. And so first, again, thanks to, to the presenters. Uh, thanks to Ranu for helping get things going and, and others on the International Committee for contributing ideas for this, uh, for this first uh, session that we're having. Um, one thing, if I could summarize, there were like seem to be two or three points that came through uh, looking at uh, uh, comments from, from Hayan and Knut and, and Asala. Um, one is just being available sometimes. So you know, whether that's the train station or, 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 or being at NARST and, and catching up at co with coffee and things like that, um, serving on committees. Um, and then within that finding common interests. So, you know, your funder wants you to do PD workshops like that, like hey, I mentioned, but in there, are there ways to, to find a parallel with others, uh, people's questions or, or research where there are overlaps? That you could find something like well if, if we do something a bit similar we might be able to to have some something where we can communicate more than than just i did this uh, but maybe we could find something in common there um but then also i think there's something that i notice is that there's you know when when a chance comes uh you might have to jump at it a little bit you know things things happen and maybe you have to take a little risk so you have a, a draft paper maybe you have to be willing to share it with someone and ask them what they think um, or, or, you know, do you want to collaborate? You, you have to be open to that a little bit. Um, so those are a couple of points that I've noticed across all of these. And um, I think that's really, really great insights. And I thank you so much. And we will have another session in October. Uh, please keep an eye out for that. And, um, and then until then, stay active with NARS. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. And with that,